I recently got to connect with two new folks, really interesting people that are farming down in the mid-Atlantic area, uh, Zone 7A. They recently purchased 14 acres of land that they get to steward in a very full way, and they have transplanted a young and growing, vibrant, uh, cut flower farm to that landscape. And they asked me to spend some time with them looking at some boundary areas, some edge context, uh, some sloping fields, thinking through food forest design that can happen in that space. How could chickens be integrated into that design? Uh, can chickens work in the winter months between the high tunnels and greenhouses that they're building? As well as some black walnut context. It was a great chat. It was nice to connect and meet them. And if you're interested in any of those topics, stick around. We've recorded all that and you can watch. Well, it's lovely to connect with both of you and see how I can be helpful this evening. Yeah. Um, I guess you already have some context from talking to Laura Beth, but I have uh, a Google Maps link and some photos uh, in a Google Drive document that okay. we could look at to get started. That's great. Yeah, any resources you want to share, I can pull up and take a look at while we're talking together. And while you're sending that along, if you just want to give me a, a, an overview of your project and, um, yeah, what sort of the, the overall context and the goals of this evening would be helpful to hear. Okay. Awesome. Would you rather us do like this screen sharing and kind of walk you through? We've got like a bunch of photos and maps and stuff. Or would you rather us like email it to you and you look at it separately or what no, sounds good? This is great. Yeah, because it's it's visually nice and full to be able to see your screen this way. This this is great for me. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, do you want to... I already got to talk to Sean a little bit, and but I feel like this is really your... Well, why don't, yeah, why don't you start with the context for this meeting tonight? Okay, cool. Yep. All right. I'm usually the like organizer. So this is like, I'm trying to let Tasha leave, but it's like a new dynamic for us. Good. So yeah. um, uh, just to like sort of repeat what happened. So we got to do this pick your own consultant program through Future Harvest Casa, which is like our local ag organization. That's awesome. We actually got to do this program about a year ago when we moved we so we just bought our own land we've been in business for 10 years and we finally bought our own property which is so wonderful and um i mean we feel like we are stewarding it rather than owning it but it's just very exciting that we get to call this place home mm -hmm. and um, a year ago we consulted with a mentor through this program on how to move the farm essentially and it was so helpful so we applied again just like this was amazing and they Basically, we didn't get it because we'd already gotten it. And then at the last minute, they were like, oh, we have a little more money. Like, do you want to do it after all? And so when we put our heads together to be like, okay, we just moved, what would be like the next person to talk to? Joshua was like, we have to talk to Sean if he's available because at this new property, you know, this we have all these opportunities to basically take care of the place in a way that we couldn't or didn't feel motivated to on lease land. Yeah. So um, we just like... I guess like the nuts and bolts, we have a cut flower farm called Butterbee Farm. I don't know if you got a chance to look at our website, but I pulled it up here. Sorry, the Zoom thing is like... Oh, no, it's fine. I can see your screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you wanted to pull up your website again, that would be good. I poked around a little bit, but having that up and, and seeing some more imagery and getting a sense of things would be nice. And so just so yeah, I understand, so I started that, that far, the farm began on lease land, but now you're establishing it on land that you are owning, stewarding, like that you have more permanent access to, basically. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So I started the farm about 10 years ago before I met Jasha. And I, my training is in organic vegetable farming. And before that, I went to music school. So that's kind of a little bit about my background really fast. Yeah. And no, we met, Joshua had just graduated from uh, MICA for the painting program, um, grad program, and was kind of looking for a career change. And we started farming together on this lease land because we couldn't afford to buy or didn't feel that we could, you know, do that. Um, yeah. So we eventually like built our business selling cut flowers to florists and designers in Baltimore and DC over the last 10 years and got really lucky and worked really hard and managed to buy this property, which is about 40 minutes north of Baltimore. So we can still have all of our same customers. And we uh, also increasingly started to grow in hoop houses, mm -hmm. unheated and heated. And at the new farm, we uh, built 
three big, much bigger heated greenhouses so that we can shift to being mostly off season farmers and take a summer break. We're trying to kind of do what other farmers aren't doing. We want to grow in the spring and the fall and the winter and then have a break in the summer. So uh, that's kind of where the business is headed. Mm -hmm. But um, just like a side note is that Joshua, although he started farming with me at the beginning of the business, for the past six years, he worked as the groundskeeper on the property where we leased land. Okay. So um, he actually hasn't worked in the business for the past six years, although we kind of worked around each other because like he grounds, he basically like mowed circles around the fields where I was running the business. So Mm -hmm. we've done a lot of work together, but he's like now full force joining in. And one of the things that he brings is a big push in towards more ecological, sustainable practices, which we already practice in a lot of ways. We're already like very regenerative compared to a lot of farmers in our area, but um, on on the farm and also generally on the property, we're just really excited to do some more, some more, a lot more. Yeah. So, it, is that a good like beginner beginner? Yeah, that's a that's context. a yeah good overview and a good sense of things. Um, it'd be nice. Uh, could you pull up your the map again, just so I can see? And yeah. Uh, so that's so you're on that road there. And how much acreage in total are you working with there? Um. The, the property is 14 acres, and it's basically this little where you see the crop field here. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's that area, and then this forest. It's somewhere, the border is somewhere in this forest, and gotcha. then it drops down to the road. Okay. And then over, and this little pine grove is the, the western edge. Gotcha. So it's kind of a, a shoe-shaped property, I guess, like a boot. Yeah, it's like a little a, a boot aiming to the left. Um, yes, with a with pines. So our houses are. Um, we we live on the property with her parents. Okay. So they're living on a house here. Yeah. And then our house is located down here. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, both, both within this sort of pine grove area, and then the farm itself is uphill from us in the crop field gotcha area but that so have you started building infrastructure in that field yeah already? okay yeah, it looks like so i'll try to give you a sense of what we've done of course it's not here on google maps but um this is the um the layout so that we have a, a road that goes up into that crop field. Mm -hmm. And then it leads to the barn, which is kind of right in the middle, Mm -hmm. and goes past the barn to our greenhouse area, which is kind of up in the northwestern corner. Yeah. And on the opposing side of that field is our outdoor um, crop fields, where we have a lot more annual um production and then we also kind of haven't quite finished planting our perennials in this this lower area but yeah this is all outdoor and then this side is all indoor so the the areas that i'm interested in um talking to you about are sort of not these areas okay (laughs) because they're sort of spoken for yeah um but all this space here actually highlighted all everything that comes up in yellow Mm -hmm. is is that visible yes so that's basically well except for this little chunk here yep um everything in there and then there's two other areas down here um that i i have open and available okay so the that looks like it might be about two or three acres three or four acres worth of total space or so yeah total space yeah maybe i would say probably closer to the two okay would you think? yeah that's probably right yeah just to, for a little more like time i don't know if it's helpful but we moved from our old place in october of last year oh. and built the farm in like basically six months so yeah like, so we haven't had a, a real season here yet we don't we don't even know what the full season looks like here yet wow. and yeah. you're so we kind of like, like let's get our feet under us and then we'll look at the big picture once we start 
you know, selling some stuff to start paying our mortgage. Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. And just so for uh, further context here, like zone nine or so, zone eight? Seven. seven. Yeah, seven actually. Um, technically seven A, but we don't really know yet because we just started farming here. So okay. We'll see. And what's the elevation at this, uh, this site? Mm, good good question. question. I know it's, you can pull it up on here. Right? Or if you zoom out a little ways, maybe we can just get it. It'd just be interesting to see like the overall terrain. So it's relatively uh -huh. flat. Um, and... We're actually up on a hill. Baltimore area is very hilly. Um, and we chose this farm specifically because it was up on a hill. We got a lot of rain here and just, you know, didn't want to have to deal with flooding. Yeah. So uh, we're up. We're up, although some of the areas that were highlighted are down. Well, yeah, it in the the property itself is sort of kind of set on a hill, so um, but pretty gentle. This north, it looks like. yeah, fairly gentle slope. It gets a little deeper down here. Okay. Um, from yeah, this corner, it's a slope downwards to the east, uh -huh. southeast. Gotcha. And there's a, a a river in here, and then I think there's one up. Or a stream. Stream, yeah, yeah not a river. Sure. Yep. But everything kind of goes down towards that river. Southeast or, facing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yep. That that's probably enough. You know, ba basic starting context for me. So then I'm happy to to hone in in the time we have in the areas that you wanted my okay. feedback or wanted some ideas i'm okay. yeah so that would be um these three spots basically and okay. i have um photos of them so you can kind of get a better idea of what they look like but they were all well besides this upper area that was a cornfield conventionally uh farmed field these other areas were just fallow um mode with a tractor type grass areas mm -hmm. so let's see the, the first spot uh, we'll start at the the northern northwestern mm -hmm. top of the boot yep <laughs> um, that's this edge here that you see this forest that's the edge of the crop field meeting that forest and that's like the corner of our property right over uh beyond these greenhouses over there okay is that great this is this is the original slope here but as it starts to meet you'll see there's a swale right there Men um, meant to which, be like a drainage ditch a little bit exactly it's a drainage ditch that uh the barn all the barn water and the water from coming down the slope all flows into that Okay. Um, and we did a planting in the swale. Yeah, we have a small, we started uh, with some willow and... Winterberry, yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of things. That's really the only thing that's planted over there is just in the swale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We really haven't had time for much yet. Is um, there is there interest in, as an adjunct or an addition to the flower aspect to plant ornamental willows or like red osier dogwood or various things along that line that yes. could be like dried and added into bouquets and things yeah okay. and we already do have some of that we we have a small portion of our other uh, farm area that's dedicated to those types of plants but actually but, we have a bunch of willow on hand another farmer gave us a bunch of willow of various kinds that we haven't planted yet and aren't totally sure where to plant so yeah, yeah maybe and, we, and we can pretty much use infinite amounts of that type of plant yeah we may that, not be able to sell 1000 million willow stems but at least we can sell especially some. Uh, especially as we progress you know, as we get older, we'll want more and more of that type of plant mm -hmm. versus the annuals. Yeah. And do you plan on having animals integrated into these systems? Yeah. So I do. We do have goats already. Okay. Um, let me try to show you that. So then willow would just be useful in a number of ways. I mean, that's, that's a great backup. We have friends that raise various types of willows to feed sheep and goats. Oh. And oh. so that could be 
not only useful as you know erosion control and capturing and putting excess water back into woody biomass and value there but then also you know pretty low-tech mulch you can just chop and drop and lay lay branches around plantings during the season and then there are folks that are experimenting with willow as a tree hay or as a fodder i definitely can say that I do not have direct experience cutting willow as fodder for animals, but I know of a number of folks that are really into it. Um, and there's okay. some there's growing resources on different fodder value of different varietals of willow, but there tends to be a lot of overlap of like willow that is good for erosion, has aesthetic value, potential for cut arrangements, etc. has catkins that are quite large and really early that support bee, and native pollinator habitat mm. mulch and then also emergency or thoughtful feed harvest um are you familiar with the concept of tree hay is that a term you've explored no that would no, be I'm not that'd be one to to make a note of there's i know on facebook okay. there's there's a tree hay group that i joined oh wow just of, course there is. of course uh <laughs> just because it's interesting to me and there's there are all sorts of examples where people are going through and pollarding they're doing late summer pollards of apples and mulberries and willows and drying them in barns in these big like bundles that they then hang upside down and let the animals browse throughout the winter. So just, you know, there's already 27 great reasons to plant these different willows. And so there's a 28th is that you might be able to yeah. find varietals that are particularly good at, at feedstock for animals that are that are woody based. Yeah, that, is that, so cool. that sounds great. Yeah, yeah, that was on my list was animal fodder. Mm -hmm. um, the the goats live in this uh, lime green ring cool. that surrounds our crop fields, and it it's our current deer protection. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> so their pasture is it's sort of this this moat around our growing area, and so far so good on the the deer experiment. Well, that's cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. We uh, saw someone who tried it and we thought we'd give it a shot because I didn't really want to put up a 10 foot fence and we have used electric fences in the past too, but it's a lot of maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, so one, one more note that I wanted to uh, put, you said that you got some different varieties of unnamed willows from some folks and you don't know where they're going to go yet. There'd be some, are they still in cuttings form? Are they just dormant cuttings or are they with pots or? They're potted. They're really root bound, but they're, they're like, you know, like the long, like maybe three or four inch wide pot. That's maybe eight inches deep. Yeah. And I think they are labeled. I just haven't looked at them, but you know, okay. it's stuff like curly willow and, um, there's oh, like cool. a black sea willow, I think, and a couple other things like that. Okay. And, um, a bunch of beauty berry which is native around here sweet yeah so the the root bound stuff i'm sure you're familiar with this idea already but it makes sense to try to find a home for them asap before they get too far along and to really cut hard you know if they're not really leafed out to just uh almost basically i go up with pruners just right up the line in a number of spots and peel the whole thing open so that they're not completely spun yeah. on themselves um we have some cherry, uh, dwarf sour cherry trees we got in pots back in 2015 that were root bound when I put them in and I didn't cut the roots and loosen them up. And those trees are absolutely, st it's eight years later and they've never recovered from that. Mm. And so we kind of wow. have to take root cuttings, propagate again and let those pass away because that initial yeah. twist just like it doesn't, it never gets better unless you help it <laughs> at the outset. That's a good reminder because often I'm too lazy, so... It's about well, uh, it's about a uh, minute. And we're like trying to do things speedily, so yeah. we <laughs> or that. Yeah. Well, you could, you know, one one very very fast way if the plants are dormant is to pull them out of the pots, lay them on the ground, and take a very sharp nursery spade and just do plunge mm. cuts, turn yeah, at ninety degrees, and then right. just pull the thing apart. You know, it seems yeah. like you're being brutal with it, but that sort of right. liberation for the thirty seconds you apply per, for the pot might mean. It might be the right. difference between life and death with that plant in the long run. Okay. okay, cool. Thank you. Good plan. Yeah. So this is the um, the first space, like I said, I called it the western edge here. Mm -hmm. It was a crop field. The, the slope is 
I don't know how many degrees. It's not five, five five degree slope or something. Pretty comfortable. And we were gonna have our chicken coop here. So mm-hmm. yeah. And our there. Well, we don't have to there. get into that yet. But, yeah. but okay. that's it's on my list. But anyway, the the forest up here is a pretty mature and actually really nice forest. Um and then yeah, this is oh yeah. The highest elevation on the property is right here. Mm-hmm. And then um, because of that and because of all the land work that was done, it does need some erosion control. So I've noticed already a bit of that. I mean, especially because there's just nothing there right now. Yeah. Um, so that that's something I'd like to address there. Do you have then, Do you have thoughts about how you would go about that? Are you thinking about doing swales? Because it seems like from a measurement and a layout standpoint, it's it's not a very complex or compound hillside that's presenting. It looks like it's more or less one plane. I'm sure there's nuance, yeah. but it's, you know, you could probably do something along the line of a key line with it where it's just find as close to level yeah. and then just map it out on whatever the spacing is um, for the machines that might go through there. But I guess that's, that's a question before before thinking about swales are like, well, what are the goals as far as planting? What sort of crops do you imagine happening well, in that space? Yeah. Let me go back to my goals here. Sure. These are my goals. Um, so I want to grow a variety of annuals, perennials, and trees. Mm-hmm. Uh, for harvest for the cut flower farm or, or just, for harvest just for, for, just to for food. have for us. Yeah. Harvesting for ourselves, for the farm, for the, the home, or friends, whatever yeah. it be, I just want there to be an abundance and variety. Yes, and the spaces we're talking to you about today are not really part of the production farm. They're no, no, not. They're, I'm thinking of them as basically like a homesteader's space or a, a, almost like a landscape. I mean, I'm not trying to be landscape be but you know i'm trying to make use of the land. Right. <laughs> like if, positive environmental use. If they weren't actively or thoughtfully designed and set in a direction more likely than not it would be a place that you would brush hog once in a while yes. to keep yes. down kind exactly. of thing yeah yes. right and, and so, i don't i don't want to sit on my mower exactly right yep um yeah that makes a lot of sense okay so right so food uh, both annuals and perennials feed for animals mulch uh maybe building material structure Generating yep. compost and fertility, um, yeah. nursery space and regeneration and diversity. Okay, um, cool. So, hearing, reading those goals, are there thoughts that you have that have been starting to develop around that particular space? Um, well, Laura Beth mentioned the chickens. Um, I think I feel like that's sort of. A component I need to decide on where they're going to be and how that's going to flow with everything because that is going to be an important aspect of the farm. I, I'm pretty keen on uh, a chicken composting setup in the realm of what you have, um, mm-hmm. maybe slightly more towards the production end, but uh, you also produce a lot of compost with your setup. So Yeah, we produce a lot of greenery from like flipping beds, you know, cutting the plants off at the base so that the roots stay in the bed, but then all the top goes in the compost and then hopefully gets put back onto the farm at one point. Right. And then we have some, you know, animal bedding now um, Mm -hmm. from the goats. And I, you know, keep all the wood chips I can keep. And, and, well, I'll I'll order wood chips if we don't have enough. And, Mm -hmm. um, I haven't gone out and and started collecting material yet, uh, but I'm not opposed to it. You mean like these bags and or even food? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. If if that could, you know, if that really could help us generate, because right now we have to buy our compost. We have no other option really, Um, and it's just not really that sustainable in the long run. Yeah. Um, Right, and also, it's, it yeah. feels like the more time goes on, the more we're all becoming aware of like PFAS and like other weird stuff that like, boy, yeah. it's just yeah. the more you can generate where you are, the better. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I you know, a common theme with every conversation I have with folks and something I'm always thinking about is like those cold calls to as many local you know, in, in looking at the, the satellite imagery of the area there's a mix of existing farms but then also it looks like wooded areas so then my first thoughts yeah. go to like you know who's who's doing um uh small scale milling in your area is there access yeah, there for are the mills around yeah is there like chip wood or you know sawdust that isn't loaded with lots of um you know uh, chainsaw goo most 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 mills use blades that are uh, lubricated with water and so the sawdust for a nice mm. diverse milled thing could be a good source of bulk easy carbon um are there are there any places that are generating square bales or round bales of hay that don't use any persistent um herbicides i, I don't know if down by you that uh, uh graze on or farmer's friend stuff is prevalent yet but there's there's definitely important questions if you're ever getting waste hay or I'm, waste mulch is to ask about you know what sort of sprays they might use on their okay. fields those are new sprays graze on <clears throat> yeah graze on g-r-a-z-o-n and and farmer's friend um are both uh really persistent broadleaf herbicides like oh, decade okay. plus um, oh my gosh and and it's becoming more and more common with a lot of commercial like large-scale conventional hay production okay. in different pockets of the country like new york state i just i haven't i ask whenever i get hay and no everyone's like no of course you don't spray hay but then i talk with folks that are out in iowa or like the southwest and they're like yeah i can't find any hay that doesn't have herbicides mm. it'll kill everything other than grass so that and that matters if you're if you're sourcing manures as a free right. you know bonus right. uh is like what are the what are the deworming things that are happening and what what is the hay that they're eating um and i just always suggest to folks my way of going about it is i say that uh i'm for for organic certification i have to ask what the sprays are uh, that you might right, be using right. and then right. that's a polite way to get the information yeah. without it being a judgment <laughs> um i like that you know, but I just even right here, like looking at this, there's Freedom Valley Farm, there's Quietness Dairy Farm, there's Country Acres Farm. So there's yeah, a lot of dairy around here, but di- there's there's a fair amount of hay as well around. Yeah, um, so that's that's no, one option, amazing. and you know, wood chips, All Star Deer Processing. There's lots of protein and mineral to be harvested from there potentially. <laughs> um, <laughs> There, you know, there's always free free resources, and then there's also the woods that you have, and the leaf litter and yeah. the duff to like kickstart and get like really good um, natural organisms, um, and you know the in a big open field like that, and with the skills and knowledge you have around the the flower farming is probably quite a bit more complex and technical than most of the nursery work we do. So having cracked the code of managing that level of diversity and complexity, you being able to establish really good cover crop regimes of like really good bio annual biomass producers that can be like down where you're warm there, you've got your Sudan grasses and sun hemp and all these other like very, very fast, super biomass producing plants that can make bulk you know, high nitrogen, medium carbon that can be folded in with your free carbon sources that you get from around there. And that might hit those numbers of, of you know, multiple yards of compost per year. Um, That's interesting. I didn't think about growing cover crop for compost. Like mm-hmm. we usually mm-hmm. just grow it for, you know, the beds where mm-hmm. they are, you know what I mean? But that's, I didn't even think about that, but yeah, we could totally do that. Yeah. yeah, especially out here where we have more space mm-hmm. than we can manage right now. So right. a lot of it could just go into cover. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's okay. And then as far as um, the chicken part of the equation, um, I just kind of assumed that well, because our barn and our infrastructure here, let me put that in is right here. Yep. Having the coop nearby to where we are all the time during the day is a good spot. I mean, that's, that's where we have our wheelbarrows and our shovels and 
all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'm not opposed to having it somewhere else. My well, without you know, there's so many questions, uh, and there's also the reality of our. So I have uh, you know thousands of days of working with our particular chicken composting system, and I can share yeah. a huge amount of notes about that. But that's also a very very specific niche. Right. It's a point point one acre fenced in heavily shaded wet front yard next to a busy road and mm -hmm. you know that that has worked well enough for us and i pine for a time in the future where we might have some more land where we'd have a very very sturdy very secure coop you know the the half inch hardware cloth in in completely wrapped around the entire yes. coop is yes. uh and that was sasha's pushing uh, originally when i was building the coop i was like ah it's fine the wood you know hemlock's thick enough it'll be fine and she's like it has to be hardware cloth all the way around so investing that money has meant that all of these other creatures that have come at night just don't get in and it hasn't become this like battle against nature and you know they're they're safe yeah. in the coop and wild friends can be out there um okay but if i were able if I were able to have a context like we, like I'm seeing in this field, where it's pretty open and uh, there's there's room for their work to be applied to different areas, I could imagine something that's like maybe it's not a chicken tractor where every day you're hiking it another ten feet and then setting up electro netting, but maybe it's for you know three months at a time. The, it's a coop that can be pretty locked down in a spot, you know, because just to avoid heavy winds and, and that sort of threat. Um, but that there is, is it, is it T posts and fencing, but with like a spoke wheel design where they can aim out in different ways or probably with the layout of this landscape, is it something where, you know, it's a coop that can be moved with a tractor once or twice or three times a year with a good quality perimeter fence that keeps them in a few hundred square feet or in per, per, potentially alleys that are on contour between young rows of trees that, you know, so if you've got your slope and it's gentle enough and there can be a coop hanging out on, you know, a, a, a pasture-like area in between where you've got tree, you know, mulberries starting to grow and pears and apples and hickory and honey locust and all these different trees that are on contour and the chickens mm. can be doing their work down the line um where maybe they only move a few you know every few months or every few weeks or whatever the schedule might mean or it's just like on one year they're on this path and the next year they move down one and they help you know keep the herbaceous layer down while the trees get established that are around them um there, there's just feel, it feels like there's a lot of different pathways you can take. It's it's an open canvas, um, but no matter what, with the heat you get in the summer and then the winds you'll be dealing with in the winter, creating a treed system sooner than later, which it sounds like you're interested in, would benefit yeah. all the characters, you you all, and then future folks that might be there, and then also the chickens. Um, they'll they'll be needing shade pretty early on, and they'll be needing windbreaks pretty early on. Um, so we can we can explore specific cast okay. of characters if you want. Um, but those are just some initial thoughts, you know. With like, you know, a couple of minutes looking at a very rough diagram in one photo, those are just some ideas that pop into yeah. my mind. I, I'm I yeah I've had many different designs for the chicken coop, some of which. Are, are similar to what you're talking about, um, some different, um, and I, I go back and forth on, <laughs> it's probably just going to be one of those things where I just have to start and see how it's working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what comes first, the chicken coop or the trees, you know, like, <laughs> well, I think, both, I, I, think I think both could happen. I think, I think it makes sense to, um, uh, the 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 tree system in the long run is the most permanent design element, and so right. thinking through, uh, ideally having a pretty good idea who the the cast the cast of trees are that you're going to bring in the let's call them the late succession 
long-term canopy elements that you know you want to have in your system and coming coming up with an idea from there of what sort of spacing between rows you know if you didn't want to do a swale earthworking system that's completely fine but that landscape seems to call for trees in rows more or less that follow contour and yeah. they'll yeah. be get their own swaling system gently slowly over time just through their root expansion and through the mulches that you're putting you know in row of those trees and right. having a having a sense of what that will be it doesn't mean that you have to have all the trees it doesn't mean you have to have planted but if you know it's going to be 25 feet between your rows or 40 feet that that influences quite a bit what the coop design looks like and how it will move through the landscape if it moves and it feels like yeah. with the amount of space you have there having something that's at least semi possible to move maybe it's on skids so that it's heavy and it's grounded but you can pull it once in a while maybe it's skids that are bi-directional that it just it's maybe it's just one row towards the top of the system that yeah. moves back right. and forth um that just gives them a lot of new brows um, we have some friends that will run their goats in an area for quite a while until it's pretty beat up looking. And then um, the day they're off, they sow it heavily to all sorts of brassicas and other saved seed. Let it get very, very dense and then let the chickens in there to knock it back. And they do this kind of like back and forth pattern that seems to be really functional. Um, but yeah, I think I think that would be the, the order that I would come at it is like who are the trees what are the spacing between the rows okay. those characters that go between the trees and like all the you know let's call them the guilds and the food forest complexity the other layers of the food forest i feel like that you can kind of plug in on the fly you know current mm -hmm. cuttings over here and elderberries over there and sweet sicily seed around that hickory or like we got some comfrey we can plug in that can happen without needing to be designed at the outset but if it's going to be chestnuts it makes sense to know that yeah. and what the spacing will be and how you how you deflect brows early on that kind of thing okay do you have a question do you have a, do you have a, no, go okay. ahead um how do you, so like on the flower farm, we think about tree spacing like in a totally different way in terms of like in, in between the rows. Mm -hmm. How, what are the factors that go into deciding spacing between the rows in this situation? Um, I, well, so it, I should be really clear. I mean, you probably know this from watching videos and things that I, I plant like a squirrel or I plant like a bird. Like I, everybody goes everywhere all the time. I'm just planting trees all over the place. Cause we, we don't have a large open field that we're moving back up into succession. We have existing canopy that we're making micro glades and clear cuts in, and we have, you know, quarter acre of lawn here. And so it's kind of scattershot planting and building up this chaotic food forest picture. Um, but if I were starting with a blank slate of a large open, like what I'm looking at in this picture, I would I would want to think about some sort of structure because there will be probably machines, machine access in order to go through and maintain for a little while. Um, yeah, there are standard spacings that are offered for all sorts of crops like if you look up chinese chestnut it's you know it's 25 feet or 50 feet between stems etc etc um i think if you start getting into a place where you can get you either growing the trees that you plan to plant out from seed or cuttings yourself so that your costs are low or you work out a trade or some sort of exchange where you're not spending twenty dollars per tree to fill out this orchard uh, I have only found positive results in planting on the closer side you get fungal life in the soil you get canopy coverage you get weed suppression faster you get mutualism with you know like all the communications in the soil that just happens a lot faster and especially where you've got animals that would be interested in browsing and you might want the compost or the the wood chips from them or making biochar um i think i think 
erring on the closer side makes sense with the idea of thinning later on and a high diversity makes a lot of sense so like for example maybe in this field there's some sort of gradient that you say okay for the machine that we have the brush hog equipment or the the tractor that can pull a potential coop i know in a straight run we need at least a good 25 feet to be able to bring that machine through without any worries of hitting branches or knocking into trees so then your row spacing is 25 feet you know in between and then in between stems uh the bubble diagram would be on the northern end of that whole layout you start thinking about the tallest of the tall trees pecan trees you know anybody hickory clan which you already identified as being in the woods already so are there king nut or cultivar hickory or pecans northernmost end of things um you know your your absolute tallest then as you go a little further south on generous spacing between canopy tree elements are your your uh full size pears and apples your chestnuts like big big diameter trunk trees sprawling trees in the future and then you come a little further south and it's your peaches your plums your apricots your bush tree hybrid so that from the southern to the northern you're creating a ramp that by default will let the most sun into the most trees over time and so that's like your skeletal backbone of the layout and then next to the pecan or next to the pear next to the apple can be your gummies or your autumn olives or your siberian uh, pea shrubs or your sea berries in other words the nitrogen fixing early succession woodies that support those trees and in between those can be the miscellany cuttings of all the currants and the elderberries the filler shrubs that are just chop and drop and and fast biomass turnover and then the herbaceous stuff finds space in between all that so it's like not burdening yourself with knowing okay every plant and it's three feet between these comfrey crowns and every two and a half feet between black current and three feet between red current it's just big scaffold elements north to south gradating and then filler shrub and then small miscellany and then annuals can also swap in as your herbaceous perennials at the beginning and then phase change over to the perennials later and that takes pressure off of you need to know like 20 percent of your total um species design at the outset and the rest evolves in if that makes sense yeah yeah, so it's totally. Super helpful because I do feel like we get a little bit hung it up. It can on, get overwhelming. Like, yeah, for sure. How, right, exactly what Just you said. Just like where to start because <laughs> yeah. you could start anywhere. Right. Yeah, and you might find like maybe there are um, conservation district tree sales in your area where you might be able to find you know good enough plums, good enough persimmons and pawpaws for a dollar a stem or a buck you know two dollars a stem that you can put in and in 10 years you thin 50 percent of them because they're not that great or they get a you know black knot or some sort of canker or disease or whatever and you can cut those make compost out of them or burn them um it's it's that's a quick way to to start filling out yeah there is the department of natural resources has that and you have to buy like 25 of them but they're a dollar each so that's that, awesome that makes sense to so just over plan yeah and over -plan. we've yeah we've had experience with that before yeah. so we can mm -hmm. certainly so the next area which kind of it just flows right in from this field is up to our barn which you can kind of see there mm -hmm. um, there is a flattened spot right around the barn and i'm imagining by the time we get to there that could be where we're talking peach and plum and stuff um so that that We've started with a little bit of compost and mulch. Um, the only thing about this area is that it's very, because of how flat it was, it tends to pool up uh, with the rain. So I, I think in there we need to figure out some 
um, in ways to encourage the water to keep moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. Um, so you mentioned peach and plum because you know I was. I was Suggest just rattling off some ideas just so there's like something to grab onto certainly in uh you know flat open full sun cool those those are green check marks for those particular plants compacted poorly drained all of a sudden they'll right. really get some x's so then you're at a fork in the road do you do you modify the landscape in order to meet those particular plants or do you say well maybe uh, you know, if if we can get plums for a buck a pop that are you know nice native wild plums that may or may not be nice or could it, or could at least feed the chickens could feed the goats cool you can trial them plums are good bottomland plants it seems um, the flip side is like okay grafted contender peaches for forty five dollars a piece now all of a sudden you have to kind of really make sure the site is going to be good for them or it doesn't make sense financially. Um, right. So the 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 fork in the road there is to say, do you modify to to accommodate the, those key, you know, more expensive, or do you say, well, we'll try plum, and maybe this is where we're putting in like high quality cultivar, uh, elderberry, and sea buckthorn, or hazelnut, yeah. which are all plants that tolerate periodic standing water somewhat poor anoxic you know slow moving soils and mm -hmm. with a mixture of nitrogen fixing and other morphology some are a little deep rooted some are fibrous um they can probably make it work and then it can be you know you get an inch and a half of rain and there's two inches of water for a week it's like eh, that's fine those plants will be fine without okay. it whereas yeah, we're the probably probably leaning towards that more because we have other areas that aren't compacted that probably that's where the peach goes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah um okay great so that is the around the barn area there's another look at it this kind of with the bed there that we started cool yeah and then um okay so this is so now we are i'll show you on the map mm-hmm right at this road entrance here okay so we're looking at this spot now okay and and we're looking in the picture we're looking can you go back to uh, uh, in, the, in the picture we're looking from the road uh, up sort of yeah up the road which would be north. sort of north yeah it's a little bit yeah west but yeah so okay looking that way gotcha um, we're, we're looking north and we're looking at the south by southeast facing slope compound there it looks yes like. okay yeah cool yes yeah you can kind of see on the right side of the road it's like more dirt that's just from them creating the farm access road so there's like some there's actually quite a lot of bare dirt there and i noticed today that we're getting some canadian thistle coming up there which is very sad to me that's yeah tough. yep well that's probably showing up well, the seed is there and the disturbance is there, but yeah, Canada thistle is pretty good at occupying spaces that are compacted. And so yeah. then if, they're, if they are to leave, um, who would be the characters that can do decompaction work that you desire? You know, is it, is it the daikons? Is it alfalfa? Is it some combination of like penetrating rooting plants? And you would probably know like who are, are there really nice perennial flowers like are could peonies do it they've got pretty hardy root systems they're pretty competitive um maybe there's some other plants that can occupy that space that could be part of the flower picture beautiful as you're coming and going and help with the decompaction work that needs to happen there yeah oh and a lot of it is oh. is um like i said a fallow landscape that has just been kind of mowed with a, a brush hog mm -hmm. once or twice a year um so and then i i can't remember what that weed i never know what is. it is um but i know that goats can eat it oh, so cool. is it not weed uh, well, it might be it's yeah it's a very tall purple like looks almost purple or red well once yeah once it's uh yeah, yeah pass it. super fast yeah. growing really like yeah. soft green breaks down fast in the summer tons of bees on them in the summer and then 
first frost and they melt back to nothing. Yeah, it sounds about right. Uh, that could be not, yeah, Japanese, Japanese not weed, which, you know, you look them up and the very first links on Google are all about how horrible they are and you got to poison them and blah, blah, blah. But you dig a little deeper and it's got medicine and there's, you know, they help with lime and they're really great nectar flow. They're not a plant to necessarily, you know, spread across the property, but um, they're probably there because of either fill that was added or some sort of machine disturbance that happened right there. If it is not weed, I, that's like 20 by 30 pixels. It's it's hard to identify <laughs> a plant. <laughs> um, yeah. But, well, there's a big yeah. patch of, of it there. And then above that, we do have a few chestnuts that are really nice. Hmm. Um, and that's kind of that that side there. Okay. And then on this side, it starts to get more into... Um, so the, the, there's a third area that we'll talk about that's through this tree line and then further down. Um, but it gets a little wetter on this side. Mm-hmm. I've noticed more, um, I think like even right here, black walnut, um, I can't remember what is growing right on, it's some sort of wild blackberry or something. I think it's just wild blackberry, yeah. We planted some Lindera augustifolia over here. We use it for the farm. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good native, and um, we planted some mountain mint over there too, just because I like it, but just for fun. Cool. So that's as far as we've gotten. Yeah, here. But, but this would be... Uh, kind of the second zone yep. that we'd want to. Yeah, the the black walnut there on the east or the right. Am I reading that? Yeah, to the right yeah. of the driveway, to the east yeah. of the driveway. Um, uh, I'm I'm guessing the blackberry ish plant would be black cap raspberry. Does that sound familiar? It's got purple stem and a really dark yes. fruit. Purple yeah, stem. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Black cap ras. I mean, that, there's different common names, but black cap raspberry is a very common understory associate to black walnut. And oh, okay. we found in that whole you know like Ribes rubus clan that realm of of cane fruits. Black caps, by a long shot, are the most black walnut tolerant. Black berries and raspberries, maybe they're tolerant, but they don't thrive under them. Um, so to that end, uh, the wild black cap raspberries, cool, they're great. You can you can manage them as though they're any other cultivar. Like you can cut out dead stems. You can take first year shoots and head them back to four feet so that they send more laterals and fruit harder. Like you could you could manage them in a thoughtful way to get more production. You can also seek out cultivar black cap raspberries. There are, uh, there's a, uh -huh. a one called Jewel, which is like phenomenal, large fruited type. Uh, there's Bristol, which is an old, you know, standby, like good quality black cap. There's Niwot, which is N-I-W-O-T, that makes a crop in the summer and the fall. And so in other words, you know, like zooming in on some detail, but but specifically what I'm trying to get at is the overstory black walnut has massive influence on who can grow there and how do yeah. we how do we lean into that? Like say, cool, black yeah. walnut, we already there's already a canopy dropping amazing food and the black caps can tuck in. That whole space understory could be amazing if you wanted to establish an eighth acre pawpaw orchard, like twenty five or thirty tree stand of them. Um or trial uh, different grafted mulberries. Uh, mulberry seems to do great under black walnut. Yeah. Mulberries, um, okay. Lots of neat options that can tuck in there. Elderberry does well, and plums seem to do really well by walnut as well. Okay. And, and persimmon. So you got like tons of options that can wow. that can work there. Well, we have a lot, and then down in the the it, where it's even wetter, there's there's more. Mm -hmm. um, Black walnuts in the in the meadow area, but that's a, here's another view. You can see the main road on the right. Mm -hmm. So that's the edge of our property, and then back in there, it's a little hard to see from these photos. Let me pull up the. I have a shot of it. Where is it? Sorry. Well, here. Okay. This is the main road here. If we were to kind of travel down it a little further, yeah. And there's this whole little edge area that's pretty overrun with um, different, like, wild grapevine, uh, a lot of um, 
So it's what is it? Honey locust. Oh yeah. Or no, oh, no. sorry. Um, what? Why am honeysuckle? I forgetting? Honeysuckle. Yeah. Why, the bad one. <laughs> yeah. The honeysuckle, honeysuckle vine, honeysuckle. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, All we'd... over. Um, I think. Uh, oh, and multiflora. Tons of multiflora rows. Mm-hmm. So in that area, I am tempted to kind of just let the goats take it back down and see what I can do after they've had some time with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mostly because it it just, it seems like a lot of the trees are already, even the mature ones are pretty overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, But that's a spot where I probably wouldn't think about doing much for a while (laughs) just because it's such a big yeah ask i wouldn't Um, yeah that wouldn't be a place in year one through five that i would apply much effort or financial resources towards establishing a new direction you know if you want like there's a lot of biomass there's a lot of dynamism there's probably lots of like green you know yeah for feeding animals and for experimenting lots of value there but yeah it'd be a it would be a big it'd be a big and not very fruitful battle that you would be taking on. Whereas you have this full sun, yes. open kind right. of denuded landscape that needs some sort of successional direction. So even though that, that area is really chaotic and loaded, it's loaded. And that's kind of the goal is like fill the space sure. with stuff. Sure. Um, that being said, depending on the trees that are in there and that are being, that are hosting the vining layer, if you care about the long-term health of the trees, you may right. want to cut the vines. If you're interested yeah. in just the most explosive biomass to feed animals, maybe you allow that to just run its course or even cut some trees and let them drop and let the vines be lower where the goats, you know, like one way or the other. Yeah. But it looks yeah, like it could right. have been a cottonwood or some other, some other like swampy bottomland species that I saw in that photo with like the multiple trunks. Um, yeah. Yeah, somebody salix or prunus. It looked like, but I, uh, you know, again, low. You know, some somebody that's like you know in a richer, more bottomland context there, and <clears throat> I don't think there is a, in my mind, some protocol of like, okay, this is technically a non-native. They must all go, or the tree is there and it's being predated on by these vines. Therefore, all the vines must go. It's really like. If it's a convenient space that has lots of nutrition, like really good, rich soil and a nice area to bring the goats periodically to get a lot of bonus free food, then managing for that chaos might actually give the most yeah. resilience for your whole system. Okay. I like that plan. Mm-hmm. That's cool. So the last area is this meadow, which I kind of skipped over. Here's a good shot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, it's... it's um, it's through, if you were to walk through this, along this tree line, and then through this kind of thicket, mm-hmm. that is this path here. Mm-hmm. So the yeah. area we were just talking about with the, the chaotic areas right there. Yep. And then this is the meadow beyond that. And I think the only reason it is like that is because they came and mowed it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it would probably be like everything else. Yeah. Um. But there it is. Uh, that's that's a good overview shot. This is obviously the lowest elevation on the property at this point. Um, here's a shot of the elevation. So our farm field is kind of up over there. Yeah, okay. Top of that hill. And then everything flows down into here. And then the stream is right on, right beyond that edge in the forest. Yeah. Well, and like I said a lot of a lot of black black walnut in that area. We there are a lot of pawpaw actually down by the stream already. Oh, cool. Um, we do have some of that, mm-hmm. and then yeah, I'm open to ideas for how we would fill out the rest of that, that area. We may not want to fill it completely. This may be an area where it's a little bit want to save some of the openness of that meadow yeah Yeah. and i also think that we talked about it in prior in terms of like what our priorities are like you know the first place we talked about we really need to figure out pretty soon the second place we also need to figure out soon so the canadian thistle doesn't become the main thing and then this is like the last thing yeah 
right? That maybe we won't even get to in the next couple of years. That's yeah. that's my initial reaction. You've got a lot going on because what we're talking about this evening are the areas that you haven't already filled with a ton of really specific and highly intimate infrastructure with all the other aspects of your farm that I'm sure would be like hours to understand even what you're doing with it. So, um, you know, I think that's with the permaculture lens, which is what I try to look through with this stuff is like, yeah, what are the areas that you can ascribe a zone four to? In other words, like uh, it, it, it's within the realm of management something you'd plan on touching, but not that you're like, I need to have real stewardship. I need I need to have a lot of say in the, the arc that this area goes in uh, as soon as possible. It's been knocked back in such a way where it looks as though pretty much the whole space, other than the few trees in there, you're at an herbaceous layer, which is not a hard lift to say, you know, in two years, if you wanted to hit the reset button, a, a brush hogging at towards the later end of summer, like I don't know the exact nesting pattern for, for birds in your area, but this would probably be a very valuable space to allow to be untouched until I'm guessing August, September for you, and then maybe a single brush hogging just to knock it back and allow a good refresh of green growth going into the winter for wild animals to be able to browse lots of good like stacked green in there. Um, maybe it's even less intervention for a while where it's a brush hog, that same idea, but instead of the whole thing, just a perimeter cut so you can walk through there or maybe there's an X through so you have some tr like access. Mm -hmm. May yeah. And then by year three, year four, five, the willows that you've established, the elderberries are starting to crop. You're getting a sense of those that work really well in, in your zone two, zone three orchard context. And you're pruning them anyway to manage them. And you've got bundles of cuttings and you transpose some of those down to here or to the east of your driveway, where in the spirit of trying to have some dialogue with the Canada thistle and migrate a different, maybe Maybe cardoon is being added there, or artichokes, or the um, peonies, or rhubarb. In other words, somebody else with deep tap roots, really large leaves, and you've got enough excess plant material of those or seeds that it's. Let's go down and spend two hours. Stick a bunch of cuttings of the the best elders we found, the most beautiful willows. We'll scatter a bunch of cardoon down in there. We'll we'll add in. A wildflower mix after we mow or like bef before things green up in the spring um, when the, f the freeze thaw cycles might draw in like a 20-way a mix of some other perennial wildflowers that could fill in some gaps but it's flat you have no erosion questions in there it is aggregating carbon it's providing nectar flow so doing nothing is awesome you're doing something you're you're allowing your you're saying yes to that space being itself, which is fine if that's what happens. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we got enough yep. to do. Yep. Um, yeah, that's that's just a few more shots in the meadow. But uh, this is exciting. So many so many things to work on. My gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does like like we alluded to at the beginning. It does feel a little overwhelming. Um, you can work for 20, four hours of sleep a night's more than enough. 20 hours a day, you should be fine. <laughs> well, I definitely want to be conscious of your time. So I don't know if you had planned to go at eight or if what's your feeling, if you, maybe we uh, I don't, keep going or we talk another time. Or... Oh, that's fine. We can keep, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll call it an hour and just keep chatting. And that's fine by me. Well, there's not like a hard line with that. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, however you, I don't, yeah. Don't know if you have big plans on this. What is it? Tuesday night or whatever. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna. I'll, I might take a bath or not. We're gonna watch. We're gonna watch a story on the TV and go to sleep. And that'll be. That'll be about it. <laughs> later <Okay. on. laughs> Yeah. Anyway. Um, I, I did have a question about going back to the chickens. Actually. Yeah. Um, so the idea of having the coop on skids pulling it if i were to have my rows on contour like we talked about would it make sense to then have my 
my coop sort of at the end of those rows and I'm able to kind of shift where they cop, pop out of there and, and into the actual areas themselves or, or I, I wasn't fully clear on, on that movement. Yeah, I think it was just a one one suggestion in a sea of, of options there. Just a th I guess uh, in in the little bit of time that we're talking together, we're getting to know each other. I'm getting a very rough idea of yeah. the landscape, and I'm not there to really make you know like oh I think it should be this like prescriptive. You know, it's yeah, definitely it's got to go this way back and forth, and it's got to start on the north end and head south. Like it's with with that sort of um, physical infrastructure, I'm just planting some seeds or scattering some seeds in your head that you can germinate. Um, but yeah, the idea would be when I'm looking at that early on would be the tree cropping system running more or less north south. I think that's the orientation or, you know, from the yeah. left to the right, heading slightly right. up to the right, however that maps out. Um, so in other words, contour, transposing that swale you gestured at that's in the, you know, that you said you've already added the willows to transposing yeah. that line upslope, basically, right. at, at relatively regular intervals that are convenient for your machine access. And depending on, so the, the coop itself, I mean, how many chickens would you plan to have in this system? Um, it, that's, that number has changed around for me because you know one day i go oh i want to make all this compost so i need more chickens to mm -hmm. to make more compost and then the next day i see my friends who have like three thousand chickens and they're completely overwhelmed with chick yeah <laughs> like maybe i don't want that many chickens um but i was thinking to start with just a couple dozen yeah as yeah, so what what would it look like to have, you know, like heavy, you know, six by six skids that that have uh, a good shave on both sides so it can get slid back and forth and then maybe once in a blue moon it goes to the end of the row and with a little bit of work you can turn it and get it to go down the next row. Does it start at one end of this of that line in the beginning of the season? Is it electro netting with solar panels that keeps them in a circular area you could make it so that they only can be in that row in between the trees although we've found that we can establish cane fruit and trees in our chicken run where we have you know 90 some odd hens in in a static oh, wow. 0.1 acre which by all accounts should be devastating to like any plants that go in there but we don't we don't exclude them from the trees much at all uh we'll okay. put a we'll put a two by four welded wire ring around a tree and then we'll drop some flat stones which might be down in a waterway by that stream you mentioned you can hike some up a good pile of flat stones around the base so they can't excavate the soil around a fresh oh, okay. planting hole and then this way you don't have to necessarily have some sort of netting that like oh no they can't get next to the trees and in that case they actually keep the herbaceous stuff down around yeah, the that trees sounds better i mean they do all your weed trimming and, and fertilizing yeah. everything happens right there um okay so and then it and then it's also a question of like what the predator pressure is you know all those variables whether or not they even need maybe they could be kind of free range and you might have a farm dog or you're there so much that by day you, it's fine and then you know at night they go in and you you have it really secure um but i it would make sense to have some sort of simple electro netting that's functional that has solar that you know works that you can start with that and then ease from there and air on the side of giving them a nice amount of free space um the the it seems as though the really intensive compost production aspect that chickens can offer correlates pretty strongly to higher density for their population in a given area. Um, okay. So it's there's like a gradient there, like slide the scale. Like I, if it were me starting from scratch again, I probably would be a little less interested in the chickens being put to work to generate finished compost for me and more mm -hmm. about them being able to graze 
enough that most of their protein and mineral needs are being met by their own work in the land. So where our feed costs are less, their overall vitality and diversity of, of uh, nutrient is widest and we get less quote unquote work from them as far as the compost generation, but have less inputs and have higher health and, and, and pleasure for the hens. Um, right. Because you're the, the generation of the compost that really could be satisfied by, uh, you know, an hour of cold calls to 15, 20 different spots where you find this one farmer who can say, yeah, you know, I, I, I got like 40 round bales of hay, of alfalfa hay laying in the hedgerow that are too wet. I can't sell them. They've never been sprayed. I'll give them to you for 10 bucks a pop. I can bring them over with my tractor and dump them. That might be all the compost, you know, if you manage that, and maybe the chickens can get on it and have some fun with it. But you basically are like turning that into that waste stream into compost. That might be all you need for the whole farm instead of buying finished compost. You know, it. I, I would ex, I would try to exhaust yeah. that pipeline first and have the chickens okay. maybe ally and associate with that. But that the chickens are their own vitality system in this young tree system you're establishing that may integrate with compost, but not, not as a, a baseline prerequisite uh, okay. of a design. Got it. Cool. That's definitely a different way of thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. I had been much more of the, Oh, they're going to turn all my compost. <laughs> you, you turn all your compost. They kick it apart. Yeah. That's so it's, true. <laughs> there's not a magic. I mean, I, you know, in our chicken system, it's miraculous how much compost we get out. And also it's, you know, hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. of heavy lifting per week to, mm -hmm. you know, bring in the wheelbarrow loads of food scraps and the wood chips and, and pile it up and they kick it apart and pile it up. And it's, it's awesome. They, they're feeding, they're being fed from all these different waste streams and we get great compost and the chickens seem healthy. Um, but there is no magic bullet in there of like, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Just, dump the yeah. food scraps and you come back a week later and it's in bags and it's compost. And it's like, there's a ton of work. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, it seems like as we're thinking about this, like, I guess thinking about how we are not always going to be in our thirties and we'll want to maybe like drive food scraps over, you know what I mean? Like making sure that we can get in with the machinery that we need. Mm -hmm. is probably yeah. that important. Yes. Yeah. Well, if we're making it on a, you know, doing big windrows of compost. Then, mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. I think, Econ. yeah, thinking about, you know, probably with your farm road and so the comp, the main compost consumption would be within the greenhouses. Is that right? Like inside those, cause you, they, they need the nutrient to be kind of like yes. handed to them. Um, mm -hmm. So my, my question would be, what is the most convenient proximal location in an ideal world that the dump spot would be upslope of the greenhouses. I don't think that that's realistic from the layout that you've described, but if that was possible, then, then by default, any excess nutrient leaching that's happening in heavy rains or freeze thaw cycles in the winter would just inherently be moving down the slope toward you know wicking into the subsoil or the or the o or a b horizon of the soil and feeding back up into the greenhouse a little and then also mm -hmm. the delivery of that material into the greenhouses would be gravity fed you know with wheelbarrows or what have you and if that design parameter could be uh, established and periodically the chickens could be maybe for the winter when there's minimal browse happening elsewhere that they're in orbit of that space. They land near the greenhouses. They have the benefit of the, uh, the radiant warmth that the greenhouses offer on sunny days. They have some wind protection from that physical infrastructure and they can work with you on the compost generation process during the winter months. Whereas in the summer, they're just moving through the greenery of this young far you know food forest system that's another lens to think through rather than the compost must be integrated with the food forest it might be 
compost hardscape you know gravel zone near the greenhouses winter chicken summer chicken or spring summer fall chicken out in the fields moving around a little bit mm-hmm. so just like a way to like different integrating them but into two slightly different patterns depending on the time of year sorry it just like I just had an idea that is really interesting, I think. I don't know. What do you, okay, so you know the the, the areas between the greenhouses? That's what I was thinking. You, yeah, I was like, yeah. hmm. Okay, so. We basically have little runs right, already, already made there. up right between each greenhouse. There's a six, it's eight, foot. eight foot gap. The greenhouses are 100 feet, 150 feet long, so okay. and we have three. So we have two 150 foot by eight foot long runs between greenhouses and in the winter the sides are always closed there's a bird shut so the, the chickens can't get in yep. inside so i guess like putting them in there would be good be- well there isn't that much for them to eat over there right now but i guess we could play well that's there. that would be the compost area uh, potentially just potentially maybe it's something if it's eight feet wide as long as it doesn't feel like a physical liability to try to get in that space with a machine like that that's where it might be sketchy but depending on the quality of machine work or you know is it wheelbarrows whatever i could imagine chickens having a really lovely time in between that space they had to be protected and super protected yeah. they're held by it there's lots of warmth there's a, there's moisture happening maybe it's a, you know uh some 20 cubic yard load of wood chips gets delivered nearby and then with the front loader of a tractor or wheelbarrows whatever you're making piles of those wood chips in that space that you're Mm -hmm. adding some you make cold calls to a bunch of farmers and you find folks that have it's not certified organic but it's not gmo or sprayed winter wheat corn oat barley whatever that you're adding into the wood chips the warmth is starting to sprout them. The chickens are in, you know, like excited to work with that. Maybe there's one or two restaurants you're getting some food scraps from in the winter months that you can add into that. They're kicking it apart. You're building, they're kicking. And then whatever is leaching, is, it's definitely going to be wicked into those greenhouses. Yeah. Um, especially, be. you know, if you did little trenches, if it's relatively on contour and you trenched at the drip line of the greenhouses, then the nutrient would sit there and probably start soaking in, um, especially if the plants you associate... It's a good use of a space that we didn't, don't know what we're doing with, too. Right. Right, because like, you're, you're either doing that or you're going to be weed whacking and mowing in there or doing something that's yeah. like already kind of sketchy to the plastic, so it might as well just be like super nutrient-loaded. Um, and yep. That's right. pretty, it would take a lot of pressure off. I mean, you're not that cold in the winter there, but it would take some pressure off of the hen's metabolic needs to warm themselves. Anytime you can offer them like microclimate gains in the winter, like, you know, southern exposed, like yeah. we, we try to play that game all the time. It's like we got the carport that has poly over it that's just a super warm space. Um, and this, the water is heated. You could do that pretty easily without even needing electricity, uh, just with the composting process. You know, warm water, sun in the winter, all of a sudden their stress levels go down and also like their total need for food goes down and they can spend more time moving and, and like being active instead of just waiting for spring. <laughs> you know, it's like a lot of chicken operations, I feel like they spend like six months out of the year kind of waiting for the other part of the year. <laughs> Right. right. So yeah. are they sleeping over there at night? Like how are they opening at night for um, well, uh, they would have poop somewhere to like go close into. By. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they they would they would have to have a really safe that I mean that that would determine the um that would determine the design of your coop a bit, that it would be something that could fit in that space in the winter months maybe it's like six and a half feet wide or something or you have one that is your summer area that's moving through the field and one that's smaller for the winter um right hmm this is so cool um i just wanted to show you a photo sorry internet's being a little bit slow no it's fine of the space we're talking about 
just to see if you have any other ideas about it. Cool. But, um, oh, yeah. So you can – um, truck well, could – what we're talking about <clears throat> is right here. Yep. I don't know if you can make that out. But, yeah. Yeah. Eight foot space right now. It's just um, you know whatever cover crop we threw in there. Yeah, and it's not even taking very well because it's so compacted and weird. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That uh, feels like. So yeah, I, I like that idea. I mean, it has its challenges in that you know getting you, certainly a machine would have a hard time. That's that's wheelbarrow territory, and that's but that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, we also have um, we have some smaller, like we have a two wheeler tractor that can haul some stuff cool and i think it would be perfect for that space yeah you uh, could explore some options i don't know if it doesn't make sense that the chickens would live in the high tunnels in the winter because those are very active production spaces yeah. um yeah, they, yeah i don't know if you can see this you probably can't but this is the three greenhouses side by side oh yeah well, that's a lot of infrastructure wow that's pretty awesome okay <laughs> yeah so, but that right, that in between space looks really small in this photo, but it is eight feet. So yeah, yeah. What that's like a thousand yeah. square feet, right? It's like eight by a hundred and fifty. You said that's mm -hmm. twelve twelve hundred yeah. square feet of um, space to to do things in. Um, yes, and there's a road right up against both. There's sides. a road on both ends, so we yeah. could access you right. know halfway on one side and then halfway on the other. Right. Nice. Yeah. But this is not. Right? because the sides are this open would be, summer, so would be this would be a winter this would be a winter right thing. just in the winter okay. yeah and it wouldn't be enjoyable for them in the summer because there's massive accumulated heat yeah. and they'd want to be under the tree like they they would much rather be out in a field where there's young mulberries and willows and elders that they can get under when it's like 100 degrees and sunny and it's 12 they want to be resting under shade but in the winter they'd love that and then so it's really just a design question of how do you you through observation just watch to see do they actually do damage to the plastic probably not if they're, if they're interested in the middle they should be fine is it something mm -hmm. with like pallets is it snow fencing and t-posts just to you know six inches off the poly um because clearly you wouldn't want to do something that's going to be detrimental to that but um Again, all of this, I, I I think it would be really clear in just the quality of how or the, the the nature of how I'm sharing it is not going to be this prescriptive thing, but just reflecting back to you some ideas based on what I'm seeing, like some initial thoughts and maybe food for thought of something that could be like, ooh, all right, let's explore that and see if it is viable, and then be like, ah, no, it isn't. But I I think I think there's a fair bit of of. Uh, extractable starting places with with these ideas i would hope yeah no it's very helpful yeah. to kind of contextualize in my head how i'm gonna approach the chickens because i just it's like every time i go to research it i come up come out with a new idea about how i'm how i'm doing them so yeah i think this is a good starting point for me that i can i can just kind of be launch off with cool yeah we should go measure that area really and get a sense of how many rows well, and, and, and even if it's not that area it might be some other winter area but the idea of sort of the summer mm -hmm. run and the winter run mm -hmm. i think that's a right yeah cool well, very sweet. helpful thank you so much sean i appreciate all your insights it's my pleasure